Good morning. How are y'all this morning? You excited to be in the house of the Lord? <laughs> Me too. Me too. Um, for those of you who do not know who I am or if you're online and you've never seen me before, my name is Trevor McNellis and along with my wife, Christy, uh, we were missionaries to the Philippine Islands for 10 years and uh, we recently came back. Uh, God's kind of relocated us back to the U.S. But this church was one of our very first supporting churches and was one of our very last supporting churches. And I'm kind of go into a little bit of detail about our transition back in a little bit and kind of give you an update on what God is still doing in the Philippines with our ministries, even in our absence. But um, if you're here this morning, we're going to be talking about the blessings of obedience. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 5, and we'll be in verse 1. And as you kind of turn there, I'll have the scriptures up on the screens as well. But I'll kind of set the, the scene a little bit. Christ has begun his earthly ministry. Now, he hasn't called his disciples yet, but he is going from village to village, and he's preaching, and wherever he goes, he's extremely popular. People have never heard teaching like he is teaching, and so the crowds are just drawn to him. In this passage of Scripture, it literally says that the crowds, uh, the multitudes were pressing in about him. So let's start right there. In verse 1. Have I got it? She can do it? Okay. Am I doing it or are you going to do it? I, okay. Okay. All right. So we'll start out there in verse 1. So it was as the multitude about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For him and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. So what we see in this uh, passage of Scripture are several really simple acts of obedience. They seem almost insignificant. It's not like where Moses went and stood before Pharaoh and demanded Pharaoh release his people, you know. I mean, that just took incredible courage. But Moses was obedient. And in this passage of Scripture, we see several times where Peter himself is obedient, but you just kind of almost read over it because it seems so simple. But why is it important for us to be obedient to God? I mean, it seems kind of like a dumb question. I mean, we're just supposed to be obedient, right, in all things, big and small. But we often resist when God calls us to do simple things. So I'm going to share with you this morning three reasons why it is so important for us to be obedient to God in all things, big and small. And the first is obeying God in the little things is an important step in receiving God's greatest blessings. Now, imagine if Peter had said something uh, like this to Jesus. Jesus, you seem really popular. You've got this big crowd of people pressing in around you. But me and my companions, we've been fishing all night. We're tired. We just want to clean our nets. We want to go home, have a glass of wine, catch the evening news, update our Facebook status. So if you don't step off, the only thing going in this lake is going to be you. Now, he doesn't know that Jesus can walk on water. Well, not yet anyway, right? That's coming. 
if Peter had said anything other than yes to Christ, he would have missed out on the most incredible fishing experience of his life. But because of Peter's obedience, the Lord arranged a miracle that he would not soon forget. Often God's greatest blessings come as a result of simple acts of obedience. God's laid it on your heart to invite somebody to church or to your life group or maybe just called you to witness to them. Maybe it's a coworker, a classmate, a neighbor, a good friend. Maybe it's a family member. Sometimes they're the hardest to reach. And yet we resist. What if they say no? I invite them to church and they say no and then it's just going to be awkward at lunch, at, at work or, you know, at family gatherings if they're just going to think I'm weird and it's just going to be awkward. But what if they say yes? What if they come to church with you? What if they come to your small group? What, what if they go to breakfast with you and you share Jesus with them and they accept Jesus as their Savior and their destiny is forever changed? I'm going to share a couple of stories this morning from the mission field. And the first one is about a friend of mine named Michael Giganto. So that's Michael Giganto up there in the picture. Um, so I, I know some of you may not know our whole story, but God called us to the Philippines uh, back in 2010. We arrived in 2011, and we worked out of Manila in the beginning. And so uh, about 2013, we started working in some southern islands as a result of a typhoon that passed through. And I've shared that before, so I'm not going to go into any detail. But while we were doing typhoon relief work on this island called Bontayan in the southern part of the Philippines, God put me uh, in connection with a new partner, Pastor Dennis Mendoza. And so we rebuilt schools and churches and homes. And God eventually laid it on our heart to plant churches around these smaller islands near to Bontayan. Bontayan's a pretty good-sized island, about five miles wide and seven miles long. But these smaller islands around it have no evangelical churches at all. And Dennis has always had a heart to reach these people. So just through God's miraculous provision, uh, he, he gave us boats to use to start this island ministry. And part of our plan was to go into these islands and do some sort of evangelical event win some people to the Lord, and then start Bible studies and eventually plant churches. And that's where I first met uh, Michael Giganto. So several years ago, we were going to three islands to start uh, hopefully Bible studies, but we were going to do what we called kids camp, kind of a vacation Bible school by boat. And we partnered with a church here in the U.S., our church uh, in Manila, and Pastor Dennis's church on Bontayan. And Michael was part of his role as a Philippine national policeman on Bontayan was to patrol these outer islands. So he was going with us as we were going to do these, you know, mobile vacation Bible schools. And it was, you know, going to be games and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he went with us not because he loved the Lord, but because it was part of his job. Michael was actually in a cult at this time. So the first island we go to is the forest one out. It's about an hour and a half by boat from Bontayan itself. And uh, it's called Daong. And so we do the camp there. And again, it's, you know, music and games, puppet show, you know, just all kinds of fun for the kids. But eventually we break them out into smaller groups and our leaders share the gospel with them. And so at this time, Dennis begins to gather the adults to share the gospel with them. And he asks Michael to join him. Now, Michael's been with us long enough in some of our meetings, and he knows why we're there, so he has to know what's coming. And he could very well have said, you know, Pastor Dennis, I'm here in an official capacity. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to patrol, and you go do your thing. But he said yes. He was obedient. He went. He listened as Pastor Dennis and my other partner, Pastor Jermaine, shared the gospel to these adults, and he accepted Christ as his Savior because of a simple act of obedience. He came out of a cult, brought his family out of a cult. And then he gets this new assignment uh, as part of his normal duties. He's also tasked with doing the drug awareness campaign on the island of Bontayan. And there's 25 communities on this island. And he used to go into each one of these communities and do this drug awareness program. Well, he asked his chief if it's okay to bring his Christian friends from this church, Bontayan Baptist Church, 
to come and do a good moral values program as well. And so his chief is like, sure, why not? So I've been with him many times as we've done this, and this is a picture of, of, of one of the events that we did. We go into the community, and each community has a big open basketball court, and people play basketball. And anytime somebody comes in to speak, like the government, uh, anybody really, because there's not TV, you know, they don't have all the distractions that we have here in the U.S., so people are very communal. They all come out to see what's going on. And so I've been there as Michael has done his drug awareness speech and he goes for about 20 or 25 minutes talking about the dangers of drugs and don't do drugs and don't sell drugs and then he starts talking about Jesus and how Jesus changed his life and I start listening to this guy who came out of a cult start preaching and then he invites Pastor Dennis up and Pastor Dennis shares the gospel and as a result we have seen literally hundreds and hundreds of people saved because of his one simple act of obedience. And there you can see these guys, they're praying in that picture right there. All because of one simple act of obedience. So the second reason is our obedience will always benefit others. Think about how many people were blessed by Peter's simple act of obedience. So the crowd before is all pressed in around him the people in the back probably can't see Jesus. They probably certainly can't hear him. So Peter says, you know, Jesus, I mean, excuse me. Uh, Jesus says, Peter, take me out in your boat. Take me away from the shore just a little ways. So again, Peter, just simple act of obedience. Puts him in his boat, sets out from the shore a little ways. Now the crowd can line the shore. Everyone can see Jesus. Everyone can hear Jesus as he's teaching. Jesus, the Son of God, who is both man and God at this time, experiences, you know, as a human, he experiences pain and hunger and tiredness. He's able to sit for a little bit. The Son of God is able to sit and rest as he teaches because of a simple act of obedience. Peter's friends, his fishing companions, had the most incredible fishing day of their life. They took in two boats so full of fish that they nearly sank. And more importantly, they had the opportunity to witness the Lord's supernatural provision. God often rewards others as a result of our obedience. I'll share with you another story about some other friends of mine. The people in the picture, besides me and my wife, are Jermaine Nation and his wife, Alan. That is who God put in our lives when we first moved to the Philippines to partner with to start uh, LifePoint Church. And Jermaine uh, did not want to be a pastor. He, he had grown up in a family of pastors. His father was a pastor. He had several uncles who were pastors. And in the Philippines, being a pastor is a hard life. Philippines is a very poor country. Most churches are never able to fully support their pastors, so they have to, to work full-time and pastor full-time. There's so much uncertainty in their lives, and it's always a struggle, and Jermaine grew up in that. And so he had no desire to do that. So just before they began to plant Life Point Church, Jermaine was working for one of the largest companies in the Philippines, making great money. He's engaged to this beautiful woman, Alan. She works for one of the largest banks in the Philippines. They're living the Filipino dream. I mean, they're planning to get married, have a house, travel, cars, do everything that they could, you know, possibly dream of and want to do. And then shortly before they actually get married, while they're still engaged, and shortly before we move to the Philippines, God begins to lay it on Jermaine's heart. I want you to start a church. And I call him Jay. Jay, I want you to start a church. And he's like, God, I don't want to do that. I've, been, I've lived that. I've seen my dad do that. I've seen my uncles. I know how hard that is. It's not me. Jay, I want you to start a church. Lord, I'm about to get married. What if Alan doesn't want to start a church? Jay, I want you to start a church. So Jay can't help it. Jay loves the Lord. Begins to pray earnestly. And then he goes to talk to his future wife, you know. But he's, he's afraid. What if that's not the life she wants? But he shares with Alan, you know, God is calling me to plant a church. 
here in Antipolo City, which is just outside of Manila. And uh, he's like, what do we do? She said, you be obedient. You start a church. We'll still have my income. We'll be okay. We may have to cut back on a few things, but we'll be okay. So they start planning Life Point Church, start meeting in small groups, having some events. And then they launch it, and a couple of months later, me and Christy move there. God puts us together with them, and we start working with them to help grow it. So church is growing rapidly. We're going to two services. We're having thir- three to 400 every week and doing all kinds of outreaches, uh, seeing lots of people one to the Lord. And then God begins to speak to Alan. Quit your job. Serve alongside your husband. Their only guaranteed form of income. And she does. And God continues to bless. They have built a new house. They have cars. Not new cars, but they have cars. They have income. And they're serving the Lord, and they are seeing so many people come to know the Lord because of their obedience. Most of the people in our church that attend Life Point Church in the Philippines are first generation believers, over 90%. So these new believers being one to the Lord, and now those new believers are winning their friends and their family members to the Lord because of their simple act of obedience. We've seen husbands who were alcoholics and beat their wives now serving as small group leaders in our church baptized, come to know the Lord and serve them earnestly, have gone with us many times um, to do missions work in the mountains around Manila and in other places in the Philippines because this couple's simple act of obedience. Often our obedience will benefit others. And then thirdly, if we obey God, we will never be disappointed. Do you believe that? If we obey God, we will just simply be obedient and do what God calls us to do. We'll never be disappointed. Luke chapter 11 verse 28 says, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Those who are obedient to God, listen to God, read God's word, and then are obedient to what God is calling them to do, will be blessed. Peter no doubt assumed that Jesus' fishing instructions were going to be a complete and utter waste of time. On this lake, you catch fish at night. It's a deep lake. The fish don't come up during the day. It's too hot, so they go deep. So they fish at night when the fish come up to the surface. So Jesus, uh, when he asked Peter, you know, take the boat out. Put down your nets. Peter had to think, this guy's crazy. But whatever, you know, I feel compelled. I feel to be obedient. So him and his companions, they go out, they put down their nets, and they catch two boats so full of fish that they nearly sink. Because of his simple obedience, Christ brought about a miracle that would grip this soon-to-be disciple with amazement. And like Peter, we have to recognize that obeying God is the best course of action for our life. He can take our lives and like an empty boat, he can fill it so full whether it's related to finances or relationships or our career, God can take it and make it something wonderful and beautiful and amazing. So, you know, my my wife and I, we've lived this. We've been obedient. 2010, God called us to leave. We're from Greenville. God called us to leave our jobs, sell the house that we had built just a few years before, take our, our, our two daughters and move literally to the other side of the world. And we were terrified. But we were obedient. We did what God asked us to do. And I can tell you, because of that, we have been blessed so much. We have seen miraculous things happen. I could sit here and tell you stories after story after story of how God intervened and people's lives were saved. And when Satan tried to stop us, you know, he was denied over and over again not because of anything that me and my wife had the ability to do, but because we were obedient and God put us where we needed to be with the right people, this amazing team of Filipinos who are still reaching people for the Lord. And so, you know, when we went over there, it wasn't like God gave us this timeline. Okay, so you're going to do 10 years, and then you come home. We didn't have a timeline. We just went because that's what God called us to do. But then, 
about two years ago, we kind of felt God starting to move in our lives again, but not knowing what he wanted us to do next. Was it come back to the U.S.? Was it uh, move to a different part of the Philippines? Life Point Church was doing really well. The island uh, planning process is in place, and it's working very well. And so we were praying about what to do, and then COVID hit. And COVID in the Philippines is not like COVID has been here in the U.S., and certainly not like COVID has been in Texas. So we dedicated, uh, we, we had just finished renovating a new church, Life Point Church, and uh, we got shut down a month after we got through dedicating the church because of COVID, March 2020. And so for six months, we could not meet as a church. Uh, we did it online. Thankfully, we had already been uh, doing our messages online anyway. So we kind of just transitioned to doing that full time. But in the Philippines, they shut everything down. Every business, the only thing that could be open were gas stations, banks, grocery stores, and hospitals. Everyone else shut down for months. We started a feeding program because so many people weren't prepared for this. Um, God provided funds and we were able to do that, but it limited our ability to move. They gave each house a travel pass and it was specifically for one person in that house. My wife was not allowed to leave the house for 86 days by the government. Imagine being locked up in your home for 86 days. Kids, children under the age of 15 couldn't leave the house until March of this year. Two years. Moms, I know you love your children, but can you imagine being locked up in the house with them for two years? They couldn't go out in the street and play. If people were caught outside of their homes, they were taken to a detention center where for 12 hours they were forced to stand in lines and wash their hands and practice putting on a face mask and taking it off and all kinds of these silly things to teach them to be obedient. Not in the good way, but, you know, like the government telling you this is how it's supposed to be. We had to wear face shields and face masks. They just removed the face shield about six months ago. You still have to wear a face mask everywhere you go. But all during this time, when we were living there, it limited our ability to get around. Pastor Jermaine, who's the, the primary pastor of our church, I couldn't even go into his neighborhood because my pass wouldn't let me through the checkpoints, the manned checkpoints, which there were three of them just to get over to his side of town. Um, to plan with him but God had already put somebody in our lives to start taking my place uh, a guy that I had taught in our Bible college over there who was actually Jermaine's cousin's husband who'd been working with one of their uncles as a uh, part-time pastor somewhere else lives in the same neighborhood great with technology so they began to improve on our online presence and God just kind of kept doing these things, but I couldn't go to Bontayan, Filipinos. Nobody could travel from island to island, much, you know, couldn't go from city to city or island to island. They've just now started to allow travel back. They just opened up the country to tourists again. So all during this time, we had to step back and just, you know, talk on the phone, Zoom chat, you know, FaceTime chat, Skype chat with our partners in different places. And it's, it was, it was okay, it was nice to be able to do that, but it wasn't the same as being there. But what we started to see was that God began to lift up these leaders that we had been training, and they began to take over these roles that we had previously held. The plan all along had been to go and start the ministry and then turn it over to the nationals. We just weren't ready to let go of it. And then COVID hit, and God said, it's time to turn it over. It's time to let it go. So, to give you an idea of how our ministries are faring. So, we, we made the decision to come home. God provided in incredible ways. We've come back. We're teaching at Greenville High School. We've switched mission fields. And I'm telling you, Greenville High School is an incredibly huge mission field. Um, I feel weird this morning because I don't have my Bible with me because it's sitting on my desk in my classroom. And I read it when my kids are doing work in, you know, on their own. And I have kids look and go, is that the Bible you're reading? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, that's kind of cool. It's like, yeah, it is. I teach world history, so we talk about religion a lot. They know I'm a pastor, so it's okay. Um, God's given us some opportunities, and we're going to continue to work and reach kids wherever we're at. 
But to give you an idea of what's going on in the Philippines, this is Pastor Dennis uh, Mendoza, our partner on Bontayan Island, and his wife, Morena. And they are continuing the church planting process. We built a training center not too long after that typhoon passed through, and we came up with this plan to start churches. But to do that, we needed to train people. So we built what we call the Timothy Training Center. And so it is a training center where we can train men and women to help us plant churches and do Bible studies and eventually pastor them uh, and turn the work over to them. Uh, the guys up in the right-hand corner of that picture, all of those men finished the program. That was our first batch. They graduated, and, and all of them are working as a pastor in some capacity uh, on one of the islands or uh, on Bontayan itself. And this is yesterday. This is our most recent batch of graduates that just graduated from the training program yesterday. Two years of intensive training. They do internship work. They go out to these different islands uh, and, and help us do the ministry there. So this uh, group of young men and women just finished the program and are currently serving as interns and will hopefully take one of these new churches as we build them. And so this is our our map of where we're working at down on Bontayan. Bontayan is the, that's just kind of the southern tip of Bontayan up in the right-hand corner. So it's a pretty good-sized island, like I mentioned. These other islands are much smaller, have populations from just a few hundred to just a few thousand. The ones where you see the check mark are where we actually have Bible studies that we've started. We've done some sort of event on the island, won some people to the Lord, and now we have Bible studies. The two black stars are where we have actually built a church and there are services going on there every week. One of them on the island of Bagayag and then that forest one out is Daong where uh, Michael Giganto got saved. The red star on Maombak is where we are currently building a church uh, and doing Bible study. So we're going this summer. We leave five weeks from today. One of the beauty things about being teachers, we have our summers off. So we can spend our summertime working with our partners, still uh, kind of taking a secondary role, but we can still connect and, and actually go there. And we're hoping to, the building won't be done because COVID has really slowed down construction, but the, we're going to do a night of worship where the building, where the roof will be and the floor will be. Won't be any walls yet, but that's okay. We're going to do a night of worship there and kind of dedicate the land, and then we'll go back and dedicate the church once it's done. But this is Bud Guy Community Church. Uh, the guy in the right-hand corner of the screen is Pastor Ronnie. Um, that's his wife and daughter. He graduated our training program, is now serving on this little island church. This was the very first place that we did evangelism on another island. Uh, first place that we actually got to, you know, build a church. It was a house that was dedicated by the man that lives there that got saved through our ministry gave us his home to convert it to a church. We just kind of created him a back area, back room and kitchen because he's just a single guy and he said, I don't need much. Um, but to give you an idea, Big Egg uh, in 2021, and this is under Pastor Ronnie, they had 41 salvations last year. 41 salvations. Three baptisms, and you can see where they're getting ready to take them out and baptize. When we baptize, cool thing about being on island ministry, we baptize in the South China Sea, and it's just awesome to go out there and step in the water and see these new believers take that step of obedience. And then this is the own community church. This is the first one that we built from the ground up. This is on the island where Michael Giganto got saved. Uh, the pastor there is also named Michael. He's Dennis's youngest brother, and uh, he also completed our training program a couple of years ago. We built this one from the ground up. He's doing a fantastic job reaching the people of this island, especially it really has an amazing connection with the young people. And last year on Daong, they had 29 salvations, and they did 35 baptisms last year. And so, again, that's just them kind of preparing them. They, they're really, I mean, they, they, they have them get down on their knees, and they pray over them and sanctify them and prepare them and then take them out into the sea and, and baptize them. It's just a beautiful thing to see and get to be a part of. This is Mombach where we bought land. We started construction. We already have Bible studies going there, both for uh, adults and for kids. So every Saturday, Pastor Dennis goes out with a team from the, the training program. They do ministry. They uh, work with the young people here. We've already seen a bunch of people get saved. 
Matter of fact, last year they had 38 salvations as a result of just the Bible studies that are going on. So hopefully uh, by June we'll have the top on the, on the building and we can, you know, have our night of worship. And again, on these islands there's no electricity, so we do things with generators. But you start playing music and, I mean, people are just, it's like a, you know, a bug drawn to the light at night. You know, they just, they, people come out of their houses and they begin to gather. And we just want to show that, you know, we care and that we love them and you know that there's an opportunity here to have community and have a relationship with Christ so Life Point Church is our home church uh, when we were there in the Philippines and it went through several transitions when they, they had just launched a few months before we got there meeting in a hotel conference room and uh, it wasn't ideal but we met every Saturday night and we were having to have two services because our, our numbers began growing very rapidly but we began praying that God would give us kind of a, a, a more daily presence somewhere. And he gave us a building that was a, used to be a textile factory. We converted it. And uh, it, was, it was great for about five years, maybe a little over five years, before the building fell into some problems. The, the owners of the building fell into some problems. And we got word that they were going to be foreclosed on. So we grabbed our stuff and moved out so our stuff wouldn't get caught up in their stuff. And uh, we ended up in a covered basketball court that belonged to one of the church members of Life Point Church. And you would think, oh, yeah, okay, so now you're meeting out in the hot air, covered basketball court. You know, that doesn't really feel like church. People aren't going to go to that. Our numbers just kept growing. You know, we just kept growing. Uh, it, you know, there might have been a few people that did fall off. Sometimes there has to be that pruning of the vine, you know. But the church isn't the building right I know this is something we all know very well it's the body of Christ and so our numbers continued to grow even though we were meeting in a covered basketball court basically in someone's backyard and we kept praying God you know we need a building you know just so that we can have a daily presence because that we couldn't do there at the covered basketball court and then God gave us this new building that was going up it wasn't very far about a five minute walk from our old building and the top floor of this new building wasn't finished out and they made us a great deal so we could even go in and finish it out the way we wanted to do it and so um, we've been packing them in until we got shut down and we're shut down for six months and then uh, when we finally got the permission to reopen it was at 30 percent and then finally at 50 percent now we're back at a hundred percent and we're up and doing what God has called us to do so we had our online services and we actually saw that jump up incredibly because our people in church would put out a tv in their yard and invite their neighbors to come over and watch you know and we had people come to know the lord because their neighbor invited them to come over and watch it online and so we know how powerful that can be but um where our church is now where that yellow dot is put us in close proximity to three new communities of 6,000 families that we could start to work towards and the problem was when COVID hit Filipinos live in gated communities you know poor middle class wealthy they all live in some sort of gated community and you can't get in and out without some sort of pass or a sticker on your car or some sort of ID that allows you through so our partner Pastor Jermaine and his wife began praying about how can we get into these communities when they won't let people in and each community is controlled the communities are called barangays and so each community has a barangay captain it's an elected position it's like the very smallest lowest form of government in the Philippines you know so if you have a problem in your community you go to the barangay captain first to try to get it settled so they went to these barangay captains and started talking to them about look these kids have been locked up for two years they're malnourished they need vitamins uh, you know we want to bring in food and vitamins and and teach them how to take care of their bodies and how to exercise even in close space and they kept pushing this uh, agenda of look this is going to be something that you when you come up for re-election hey we brought food in we let these people come in and they they took care of your kids and they fed your kids and they brought vitamins in and did all these things and these brown guy captains agreed so we did a, a Christmas project offering out of our, our church family fellowship down the road and raised money so that we could start financing this and, and 
providing food to these families, and we're not feeding all 6,000 families, but we have gone in and identified families that were open to having us come in and do this and also do a Bible study in their home while we were doing it. Now that the Philippines has kind of opened up a little bit, we started gathering them at our church on Friday mornings. And as of uh, several uh, of these have come to the church, they, they go through a Bible study in small groups, but they're starting to come back to church for the regular service on Saturday nights. And just last night, they had five new parents attend, and four of those accepted Christ as their Savior. Just, you know, to give you an idea. Last year, our church had 44 salvations just through our worship experience. We did food relief, uh, had 139 salvations. We do a yearly Meet My Kai Big and Meet My Friend party. That's kind of an outreach that we do with our small groups. We had 229 guests come to that and 139 salvations as a result of that. So God is still moving through the ministries that we just were blessed to be a part of starting. You know, they're growing. Honestly, they're thriving uh, because that's, that was God's plan was for us to go and, and help them get started, but then turn it over to the nationals, let the nationals reach their people for themselves. And so the, the last thing I want to share is, as a, as a missionary, as a person, uh, probably one of the greatest things that could happen to you would be to have a boat named after you. And so this is one of our boats. These are the type of boats that we take out uh, to the, do the island ministry. And Pastor Dennis has to get them repainted every couple of years. And it had, I think it had Family Fellowship's name on the side of it before. They painted it and put my name on the side, which I thought was really cool. You know, you've made it big as a missionary when you get a boat named after you. But uh, again, I just want to thank this church for partnering with us. You were with us from the very beginning. And uh, Pastor Jimmy, you know, I know he's, he's not here. I'm filling in for him. I'm the substitute today. Um, but I, I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to be back here with you and kind of share with you, you know, our story about coming home and how God is going to continue to use, you know, what y'all did in supporting us as we helped to, to launch these things will have eternal dividends. I mean, these things are going to continue to happen. People are going to continue to come to know Christ in the Philippines because, you gave and helped churches get started. And so I know it seems, you know, like a trivial thing when God asks you to give to missions, you know, and you're like, well, I, you know, I can't give much, but uh, yeah, sure, I'll give a little. But you have no idea what kind of impact that will have. And when so many different people give what they can, it adds up. And you'd be amazed at what we can do with very little in the Philippines. And we just want to thank you guys for that. So uh, with that, I'm going to close this in prayer, and I'll have the worship team.